it's very easy for men especially to get into that mindset early on when they're young and successful but all of a sudden 21 turns into 25 turns into 35 and then you wake up and you're almost 50 years old and you don't have much to show for it because you were just living right welcome to maxed out man helping you become the man you were made to be Hey guys, it's Kevin Davis from the Max Down Man Podcast. I'm super excited to have my guest Daniel Poppers here with me. He and I got connected a few weeks ago, I think. Maybe it's been, it, it was actually before, oh man, it's been like three months. Uh, so we, we <laughs> time flies. Uh, so we got connected, so I'm super excited to have him on. I think he's a guest that everybody should um, listen to. He's got some crazy new projects going. I'll read his bio in a second. Before I forget, go to maxoutman.com. We've got tons of stuff over there, um, and make sure you check out other episodes of the podcast. Please rate and review if you like them. Helps us get the word out and uh, continue to foster this. I do want to announce I have a few spots open for coaching. So if you're interested, if you've listened to the show, you like my style, and you think I can offer something, I feel like I do have a lot to offer. So we can talk marriage, family, business, health, fitness, whatever. So send me an email, kd at maxoutman.com, and answer two questions. Why you want to work with me and what you'd like to get out of it. And that's it. We'll start the application process and see how it goes. So let me read Daniel's bio. Daniel Popper is a, uh, is a proud father and loves spending time outdoors with his three children, pursuing their ideal life, which is awesome. Outside of the office and stock market, you can find somewhere taking advantage of California uh, in the surf or snow, boating, fishing, taking photographs, playing hockey, or performing on stage. I want to hear more about that. Uh, Daniel's also been in the financial industry since 2013 before joining LPL Financial in 2017 and later partnering with long-term colleague and friend Jim Din Dolk in 2020. He built his business at Edward Jones where he recognized he, had, he was recognized and awarded for opening his own office in Folsom, California from scratch. Daniel's always been an entrepreneur at heart. And he's proud to be an independent financial advisor with LPL Financial, where he's able to tailor product and service offering closer to the needs of his clients and able to truly focus on fiduciary standard and put clients' interest first without corporate pressures. Long bio, but I, I do want to educate people on, on, all of, on all of what it means to be a financial advisor, how the entrepreneurial spirit breaks into that and all that. But at first... One of the big things, first of all, thanks for coming on board. Uh, secondly, one me. of the things I always want to do is get the backstory for the guests that I have. Because I think that that, you know, people are like, oh, he's a he's a finance geek, right? Like he's going to hang out in his office and play Tetris while he watches the stock market. He's got 17 monitors, all that stuff. But like to hear some of your background and I know how important family is, I think it's great to just learn that. Expectation stereotypes are true, but a lot of times they aren't. So if you would, just kind of give me your backstory and, and kind of lead us up to how you got to where you're at, what you're planning on doing and, and all that. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate being on the, the podcast and excited to be here. So, um, you know, I typically work with high achieving men and help them get out of their own way so that they can enjoy the things that they want, show up at home. And like you mentioned before, live their ideal lifestyle. Um, you know, I, I really am proud of the, the name that I have for my independent firm, uh, Ideal Life. I think it's representative of more than just money because that's really what being a, financial, a, a great financial advisor is about. It, it is about the life and the lifestyle and connecting the numbers to what's important to men and their families. And for me and how I, you know, got into this industry and why I'm so passionate about it, you know, it, it comes from a story, you know, at my own home. Uh, my dad published a pretty successful golf magazine for over 35 years uh, in the Palm Springs area. Uh, he was great at what he did. He was a great writer. He's, uh, you know, found a lot of success and, you know, he even talked to me a lot about investing over the years. Unfortunately, um, he's, he's having to go back to work in his late seventies. He's, he's a substitute teacher now. And I think that's mostly because he 
didn't get involved with someone like myself. You know, he preached to me about the importance of, you know, putting away and, you know, investing in mutual funds. But, you know, just like everybody else, he's, he's human and emotional. And when we react on our emotions and make financial decisions based on those emotions, uh, that can have a long lasting effect. So, uh, it, it, it kind of, kind of strikes a, a nerve at home, um, but is, is fuel for, for my fire. And, uh, I, I would love to help as many families as possible to not have to work in retirement because they, they feel like they need to, uh, a lot of people do tend to, you know, keep themselves busy with either a second job or a become semi-retirement because they don't want to sit on their couch all day. But uh, I think it's important for people to not only identify what it is they want, but have a plan to get there. So uh, I, I'm an advanced financial planner, not just a, a money manager and, you know, watching the stock markets all day. The One of the biggest things that I think is important for somebody's portfolio is to not only have them tied to, to goals, right? Um, I'm a goals-based planner. What are, what are the steps to get there? What does that execution look like? What happens if XYZ happens or ABC happens, right? Uh, there's so many variables in, in all of our lives and at our different stages of life that can have an impact on that end result. So, um, I, I got into the industry about, uh, gosh, what is it now? Well, over 11 years ago. And, uh, I've always been attracted to just helping people in general from, you know, back in, in high school and middle school, peer group counseling and things like that. Um, all the way to, you know, being, a, being a counselor myself, uh, for, for young kids and camps and, and that type of stuff. And I witnessed my, my wife at the time, uh, was a financial advisor and I would go to these, these events and these galas and I would have clients of hers come up to me and show how much gratitude they have for, for meeting her and the things that she was able to do. And I was always like, that's awesome. Like I, I want to do that. So, uh, you know, eventually I, I had some job changes come up and I had to take a look deep inside myself and, you know, I, I, I took a leap at the time. It, it's one of the more difficult industries to get into, let alone, uh, find success in. And, you know, I started at a, at a company where we, we literally knocked on doors. I'm not sure if they're still doing that these days, but I, I knocked on thousands and thousands of diverse and talk to people about their money and what was important to them. And eventually, uh, you know, I got to a point in my business where you know, I had to take, take a look at what was, what was in the best interest of my clients? How could I best serve them? And so I, you know, left the more corporate world and uh, became an independent financial advisor uh, with the biggest broker dealer in the country. So, you know, I think while I say independent and you might think I'm just sitting in an office by myself, I've, I've got thousands of people behind me helping me with research, compliant, compliance, money management, uh, all those other things are important and essential to running a financial business, but I get to do it the way that I see fit. And, you know, that's all the way from deciding what kind of planning software I want to use to what type of portfolios I want to manage, how I want to manage them, what types of investments go inside of there. And those are all, you know, tools, right? And I've got to have the tools in my, my bag, in my tool bag to be able to do what I truly like to do. And that's talk to people, talk to families, find out what's important to them and help them get to where they want to go. Yeah, that's that. I love. There's so many parts of that that I want to dig into a little bit. But I, I love the idea of this. We talk a lot um, just with marriage and family and business. Is this idea of servant leadership, right? And and that really is yeah. what you're describing with your clients. Like you, and it's funny because I had a, a a buddy of mine's episode just dropped our last week. Who is a credit repair guy. He's like 20, 23 years old, really good at what he does. But he, 
he talked about it in a similar vein as like, I want to help that young mother be able to get in her first house, right? Like there are certain steps and you think, Oh, credit repair is scammy and all this stuff. And, um, but like there, there are certain solutions that each one of us can offer with our vocation, with our business, with our, with our heart. And I think that servant leadership is amazing that we're doing that. with the financial um, planning aspect of it. I also love, you know, you just what this idea of creating an ideal life. That's, that's ultimately the goal. I've said a ton of times, probably on this podcast, if money is your goal, you'll never make enough. Right. Like oh, it's that. just there, there is never going to be enough because you're striving for something that's a moving target. Um, I actually, and I've talked about this on the podcast several times since I did it, but I raised all of my revenue goals for 2024. And I wrote three things on my board, which is have fun, serve others and build a life. Oh, I love that. And because I was so focused on the money aspect of it that it wasn't any fun and it was stressing me out. And, you know, I've made some poor decisions like we all have. Um, but that whole idea of money is supposed to be here to help you build a life. Don't sacrifice your life in order to build wealth, which I think is, is so often what people do. Yeah. And it also, you know, it reminds me of just how important that, how important mindset is. Right. Um, I'm, I'm always taken back by, people that I meet that maybe don't have a lot of means, but they're like uber happy, right? Mm -hmm. They're, they, they've got always got a smile on their face. Their, their situation is less than ideal, but there's just something that they put out to the world that might be drastically different from someone who's got a couple million bucks in the bank. And you know, they, they don't have drive. They don't have focus. Um, and they're still questioning like, what it is they want to do with their lives. Um, you know, I mentioned tools before in how that helps me do my job, but in reality, money is just a tool, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's to, you know, sure. Help us get to where we want to go, but it's not the, not the end all be all right. Um, and I think, a lot of people come and sit in front of my desk and they want, you know, a quick answer, a quick solution. Like, Hey, I, I want to make a lot of money and, oh yeah, and I don't, don't want to lose money though. So, uh, that's, <laughs> I don't that's, want any risk. I just want all upside, no risk. Can right. You make that happen? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, something I didn't mention before is, you know, about being a fiduciary and what that means is I am legally responsible for the decisions that we make with my clients and the recommendations that I, I make. And it's kind of come full swing from back in the days as being a stockbroker. You almost don't even hear that term anymore where, you know, that's the guy that's sitting there looking at the, the screen all day and trying to get you to buy or sell something consistently trying to generate commissions. It's just not in the, in the best interest of, of the client. And I think the relationship of client and financial advisor has maybe been overshadowed by that impression in that, and that, you know, Hey, this guy's only there to make, to make money. And, and, and I am not comfortable being in a situation where there's a conflict of interest or there might be a, a lot of risk involved, right? Um, when you're selling individual stocks, yeah, your, your investment can, can go to zero. And that's, you know, a risk that I think people might falsely think that they're always getting into when they, when they have a relationship with a financial advisor and that kind of, it was that risk part that I was talking about. I want to make a lot of money, but I don't want to lose money. Um, and really it's come full swing in the other direction, uh, being a fiduciary and having an advisory type relationship it doesn't matter what types of investments that I recommend to my clients. I, I get compensated all, all the same. And in reality, if we're not, if you're not involved in, you know, individual stocks and things that could actually go to zero, if you stick to a long-term plan, there's a really high level of confidence in, in being successful. 
there's so many variables uh, that you have to take into consideration. Like you mentioned before, time is one of them, right? Um, it, it's it's heartbreaking sometimes when folks come in in their you know in their fifties and they're like, all right, I'm ready to start planning for retirement now. It's like, awesome, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's 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 only so much that that I can do. Uh, granted, I you know I I love to help folks in in all stages of life, but at some point you got to be realistic of, of where you're at and you know, you're probably not going to be able to generate a couple million dollars in, in 10 years. Right. Um, but right. yeah. So what do you, in that case, I'm 52, like, what do you say? And I, we started planning, but I haven't planned to the level that I should have. Um, my situation is different because I don't actually plan it. Like when someone says, what are you going to do when you retire? I'm like, I don't know what retirement means. Like I'm just a, I'm a serial entrepreneur I plan on living to be 120. I'll probably work till I'm 119 and whatever day I die. Um, I, th- so like retirement for me, there's this, it's like so far out. Right. But for most people, they're looking at retirement from jobs and, and all, all that sort of thing. Uh, and I do want to talk about kind of the, the other side where time is on your side, but what do you, what are you recommending for those people? You should be like, well, you know, when are you going to retire? 55. Well, I have some bad news because you're not going to retire at 55. <laughs> so, you know, like how does that conversation go with most people? And I know each individual person has a different yeah, situation. Uh, sometimes that that's precisely the, the things that I have to, to tell folks. And so, you know, when we're doing a discovery or a strategy session where I'm learning about all the ins and outs of somebody's life and I put it into, uh, into a plan, a written financial plan and, out, out comes the the outcome and the level of confidence and you know you want to see a hundred percent but it's not always a hundred percent right uh, and especially when time isn't necessarily on your side uh, so sometimes it's yeah hey you might have to work a little bit longer or you know I know you wanted to buy that boat this year but you probably shouldn't do that if you if you stick that money into XYZ investment or spread it out over the next 10 years doing this you actually could you know get closer to your retirement goals. So it's, you know, it is a balance of lifestyle and, you know, uh, something that comes to mind is, you know, the conundrum of instant gratification versus delayed success, Mm -hmm. right? And so it it might Mm -hmm. be, you know, pumping the brakes on some of that instant gratification, whether that's, um, you know, watching how many times you go to Starbucks or, you know, holding off on a major purchase uh, or or a vacation so that you can have those more ideal things later on. Now, more typically, when uh, you know folks your age come into my office and we're talking about financial planning, you know they they they've got some stuff going on. Sometimes a lot of great stuff. You know they've they've been socking away in their four hundred one ks. They've been taking advantage of matches from their employers, but they're getting to a point where they're starting to take a look. Well, like is this enough? How long is this going to last me? Mm-hmm. What happens if I get sick? What happens if my wife gets sick? Uh, and so a lot of time we're focused on the what ifs at that stage and, and what types of things can we do to protect what you've done already? So we, we outline a retirement income strategy like, okay, well, we're planning to have this amount by age, let's just say 65, and you'd be able to take out this amount for your spending, but what happens if one or both of you, you know, come into a situation where you need assisted care? And unfortunately, that's one of the larger conversations I I have these days is, you know, more and more we're living longer, right? So um, there's an increase in the amount of mental incapacities where we're needing care at a higher level that we hadn't really seen at with the intensity and the frequency that we're seeing now that we haven't really seen that, uh, in the past. And that whole landscape has changed. Uh, you know, when I first came into the business to be able to protect for something like that, you were, you were paying, you know, $10,000 a year for something that you may never use. And, uh, that, that kind of got a bad connotation. Well, that's changed over the last 10 years where we're able to come up with strategies that give folks you know, benefits while they're alive, 
but then also mm-hmm. have an asset there for for their heirs when you know when that time comes when you're, they're no longer around. So, you know, the the bigger thing that I'm seeing with folks in their in their fifties is is planning for the unexpected, and you know to to self insure or to self pay for uh, a level of care that you're not accustomed to can can break a really good portfolio, a really good existing plan. So kind of taking a look at, you know, what those different variables are uh, and taking a look at family history, longevity, kind of looking at, looking at health, health and wealth have a, have a connection and being able to manage both of those or have the wealth in place to help preserve health is, is a, is a strategy and goal that we look at for folks that are later in their investment life cycle. Yeah, I, I, I'm interested in, in knowing how you get into that, you know, what you do with that part of the conversation, right? Because, like, for me, I want to, like, I want to be healthy and just drop dead healthy, <laughs> which makes me, you know, it, it's a weird way to say it. Um, I always joke and say I'll probably fall under, fall off something or something heavy will fall on me just by the nature of who I am as a person and what I do with my life. But, like... It, you know, let's say a guy comes in in his fifties. He's a smoker. You can smell it on him. He, he's on his ninth cup of coffee that day. He's 50, 50 pounds overweight. You know, and like, are you able to? I mean, I know that you get like really personal relationships with people. Like, are you able to say, "Look, first of all, this isn't going to be an issue because I don't see you. you're not going to say this." But like, you know, if you have twenty years left at your current lifestyle, that would be surprising. So here's some things that. Like, do you, are you able to get into that conversation? Sometimes. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm not a doctor or sometimes I might play a therapist, but, uh, you know, that's, that's not so much my job. I think it becomes a little bit easier when you do connect it to the numbers. Right. So, you know, we're looking at a financial plan. You're here. You want to be here. Well, let's, let's stick a what if in there and through the, the type of, uh, software that I have. I, I can create like a toggle, right? Can create lots of toggles. Mm. Okay. What happens if you have a heart attack? Boom, right here. And you're in the hospital for X, Y, Z. Or probably the bigger one is what happens if you have like a stroke, right? And where, yeah. y- y- where you, you are potentially going to lose mental capacity. You're still here on this earth physically, but you're not able to do some of the things that you're accustomed to doing that everybody's accustomed to doing that's going to take you're going to have to have money to throw at that right so it it it, we can turn on that toggle and see what that effect would be on on what an otherwise successful financial plan would be and you know if we kind of catch it early enough i mean the exam the example that that you uh provided there might might be tough to insure somebody like that but you know what um Mm-hmm. there's there's insurance for smokers uh there's there's all kinds of companies out there that will insure against you know these unpredictable events right of course the the worse yeah. your health the higher that you, you're gonna have to pay and some folks just you know do have to accept that they're that they're uninsurable but that's you know that's kind of a somber and last resort type of type of discussion um but i i become used to being uncomfortable in those in those types of situations you know we basically talk about death almost you know every every planning session that we have we're we're planning for you to live until you're 90 years old or 95 years old um right. and you know what happens then what happens you know under a time of stress so yeah those conversations are are difficult but they're they're necessary and Hopefully, and maybe this is a good uh, dovetail into the other segment of folks you you want to speak to today. Hopefully, you catch that earlier, right? You know, as a as a planner, the earlier not only that you can start building your your nest egg or your wealth, but the earlier that you can also plan for those unforeseen circumstances, the more leverage you're going to have, the more time you're going to have later, the more content you will be as you get older to know that you have these things in place. And so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about working with, uh, well, I, 
I, I, I haven't coined the phrase, but there's a term out there called Henry's. If you're a Henry, you're, you're a high earner, yeah. not rich yet. And, uh, Oh, I love and that. so That's I, really I cool. really enjoy working with those folks who maybe are on their second or third job out of college. They're moving their way up the ladder. They're making more money than they were last year than they were the year before that. And it's like, okay, well, what do I do now? What do I, what do I do with this newfound success to make sure that it's continued throughout my life? Yeah, I love that because it's, you know, the earlier you start in all of these things and I, you know, to your point about having those rough conversations and what it means to be insurable and all that. I always, I always tell people you're going to pay for your health. Yeah. When you, if you're working out, eating right, meal prepping, you know, buying good supplements, whatever those things are, that can be, that's expensive in time and sometimes in money. Well, you can pay for it then, or you can pay for it later with hospital, higher insurance, your life in some cases, yes. right? So like that's, you know, and I talk to a lot of guys that are my age and I'm like, dude, you, you have got to start now, right? Like you're not 80, you got plenty of, I was a personal trainer for years and I had clients start at 80, not able to get up mm -hmm. off the floor, um, you know, it, under their own power without doing the whole old man rollover and all that stuff. And to be able to do like squats and deadlifts and ab crunches and all of that stuff, like, your body will respond. And I, I think there's a really cool um, connection and parallel to like your financial health with your, your physical health and mental health also, um, because it's not something I think a lot of us think through because that same guy that's, you know, just had his sixth Starbucks and his 12th, you know, cigarette, which was my dad. Um, he's who's still alive. Quit smoking a long time ago, but the, like that guy is more worried about his money and doesn't even consider the impact of his lifestyle choices that, that are for happening. sure. And they're, they're all intertwined. And I think if you can have that positive mind attitude around the way that you think about your health and your money and, you know, have, have someone on your team that can show you that connection and, and help guide you along the way, you're, you're going to, you're going to feel better. I mean, ultimately, isn't that what, what it's all about? Um, you know, we're, we talk about money and, and numbers and how it may never be enough if that's all you're chasing. But how does it make you feel? You know, I've been super blessed to be able to feed into the lives of tons of men from all around the world and all walks of life. And I'm very excited to announce that I do have a couple of spots available right now. If you're interested in working with me and we can talk about pretty much anything, marriage, business, fitness parenting, being a dad, uh, dogs, cars, whatever you want to talk about, I'm available to do that. We want to focus on the things that may be most beneficial to you and some things that you may not even know would be beneficial to you. You've listened to the podcast. You kind of know my style. If you are interested in working with me, I want to try to make it as simple as possible, but I also want to make sure we're a good fit. Send an email to coaching at maxoutman.com and just give me two pieces of information, why you would like to work with me and what that might mean for you, what things you would hope to accomplish by meeting with me. That'll kick off the process. I'll reach back out to you. We can jump on a call and see whether or not it would be a good fit. So go to maxedoutman.com, coaching at maxedoutman.com. Send me an email uh, with those two pieces of information and we'll see if it's a good fit. And I hope it is. And I hope that we can actually connect. And, you know, when, when people express to me on the other end of a challenging financial situation that they feel better. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate reward for me, despite, you know, any compensation that may have come along the way where, you know, I'm, I'm affecting lives, not only in, in their, in their pockets, mm -hmm. but their, their overall well being. Yeah. Cause you're a component of health then too, cause the mental stress and mental health and all the worry and, and all that, if you can help them, mitigate the risk a little bit and mitigate the stress around it because there's a definitive plan. That's a, that's a huge, huge impact, uh, in, in what it is that you're doing. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, so we were talking about, you, you kind of did it too, but I want to talk about like what mistakes are people making like in their, let's say mid to early 
1950s. What are they making today? Obviously, there, there are mistakes that they could have prevented, um, you know, over time. And then kind of let's contrast that to, uh, and then what can they do, you know, to kind of correct those mistakes or get, get because, you know, there's this, there's a saying that's like, you can't unscramble eggs, right? Like you just, you, you work with what you start, start to work with what you've got. And I want to contrast that with some of the mistakes that young people are making, these, you know, guys and, that are in their, you know, 18 to 30, let's say. Um, and then what things are they able to do that would best set them up? So they're not, you know, 50, almost 52 like me saying, I wish I could go back to 18 and make better decisions. That's, that's a great, great question. So I'll start with the first demographic there. And I, I think what a lot of, folks in the late 40s early 50s range who are kind of they can see retirement on the horizon right uh and some of the mistakes that they make at that time is not looking at what what is that what does retirement mean right you don't just sail off into the sunset with a couple million dollars when you hit age 65 and call it all good right as i mentioned you know i we plan for you know uh to the end of life, right? 90, 95 years old. And you've got to have enough money to last all the way through that. Your, your investing life does not stop when you retire. It must continue. It changes and evolves. But what happens at, at the retirement is, you know, you, you start drawing down from your assets and every, you know, everybody's different. We take a look at where all the, that different income is coming from. But well, let, let me ask you a question, Kevin. Do you think Social Security is going to provide you or anybody you know with the amount of income to help live the lifestyle that you want to live in retirement. Dude, if it's even there, if, if I retired at 65, if it's even a thing, I would be surprised. I get that honestly. a lot. I, it's not going away. That's not where I, I, I'm, I'm getting with that. You know, it's, it's going to evolve and it's going to be around even for my generation and for my kids. But yeah, that they're probably going to start bumping the ages up. You're going to have it's going to be older and older. It's going to be less benefits. Something will be there, but the underlying mm-hmm. answer to my question that that you gave was n- no. It's not going to be enough, right? No, no. It's, there's no way so it'll be enough, right? Getting people in that uh, stage of investing to think about what that let's just call it a pile of money. What, what's that going to do for you when you retire? It's got to provide some income, so. That may mean reallocating some of your funds from, you know, mutual funds or stocks or bonds to to an asset that's going to provide you with with income, right? With a with mm-hmm. revenue when you're no longer working, and so there's a return on investment for you know certain products. You know, I'm, I'm not here to sell products or anything like that, but. Um, shifting that to looking at what that benefit is. Like if you could create your own pension for yourself where you know that you're getting, let's just say a thousand bucks a month, every single month for the rest of your life, when you retire on top of all that other stuff that you have going on, that might solve uh, a piece of, of your puzzle, right? So I think the mistake people make is being closed minded in whatever their investment history is thus far, whatever their impression impression is of making a good investment because there are there are things out there that can provide to you what you really need in retirement that you may not think or you know if you look at it right now like it's not it's not a return on investment it's not giving you a rate of return right now it's not something you can touch hold and feel but what it might be able to do is supplement your income when you retire so that you don't have to touch that pile of money you can let that continue to grow you might be able to take that extra vacation in retirement. You might have some extra funds to be able to give to your kids or your grandkids. Um, you know, one one thing that I, I really love talking to folks about when when they're in retirement is there that the, when people get into the giving stage, right? Like, um, you know, I, I met I met somebody in in my my book interviews who was really well off and he's like, like, I'm totally all good. What I love to do right now is I, I, I want to give it away in, in the right ways and, and help people live better lives. 
So if I can help folks in their late 40s to uh, early 50s do some kind of more later stage planning to take some pressure off of their portfolio or off their 401k, it might actually be a greater benefit than just throwing money at those assets that they currently have. Yeah, because there's really, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, this is more of a question, but there is kind of a, a distinction, and I know some products do both, but there's kind of like, all right, so we're growth-focused long-term, you know, versus like we're growth-focused or we're totally income-focused where you have income-generating products, dividends and those kind of things, right? Um, or there's there's sort of this mixture of both, which is I'm assuming what you recommend. Is that kind of does that kind of explain what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, and you know, you hear the word diversification; it's kind of almost a loaded and ironic term in the industry now. But you, you want to not only be diversified in the you know in the actual stocks or mutual funds that you might have, but what other types of investments are out there? And you know what I was alluding to, um, you know, is is annuities, which they have, that's mm-hmm. another thing that ha- has a bad connotation over time, mostly because one, one particular person uh, that you see in all the commercials is just bad mouthing it. Right. But that, that is something that has evolved over time too. And as, has been made better for clients. I put my own mother into a, an annuity and I, I saw exactly how it works. And the reason I bring that up now is that demographic that you're talking about, that, it, that is a prime spot to purchase one of those. Um, and there's so many different mm-hmm. kinds. We don't need to get into the details, but what you can allow it to do if you're in that stage of, of investing, that, that life cycle of investing is you can, and, and that's both components. You have a growth and an income component to those where you're allowed the, you're able to allow those to cook, so, so, so to speak. So you can, mm-hmm. you can get some growth out of yep. it before you need to start drawing down from it. And it's really the only space that financial advisors are allowed to use the G word, guarantees, right? So that's where <laughs> yeah. you can get some guaranteed income for the rest of your life, but they don't always make sense if you're just, if you just want to throw money at it and, and get like an immediate annuity, which can be done, but the, the real sweet spot and maybe, the, you know, going back to your question about mistakes at, at, at that age that people make is is discounting something like that or not seeing the true value based on, you know, the impressions that they, that they think that they have that may be false. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I'm like your prime demographic. I, uh, we, I've been self-employed for 25 years. We've, you know, we've got some stocks and mutual funds and that kind of thing, but we're not aggressive about using it. We're not aggressive about planning. You know, we'll, we'll have to schedule a discovery call after this podcast. But, um, but like, I represent that person. I've got some money. Um, I've got some cash, but I also have some debt. You know, there, so, like, there's all of this thing. And it just makes me, like, in your in my mind, I'm like, dude, what am I doing? Right? So, like, I, I want to, you know, but, again, you have to kind of start from start from where you're at. And, and I, I just, I'm curious about your, a lot of times I say this podcast is from my own you know, edification. And I'm glad people listen along, but I've done some real estate development. I've got friends that are in real estate. And a lot of it is like that burr, which is you know, buy, refinance, buy, renovate, refinance, repeat thing. Right. So the idea that a lot of people think when they think about that is like house flipping, right? So you're trying to make, you're trying to make a quick buck, move on. But the burr method is really more of a, you basically make, you, you, you try to get cash free income, out of the refinance that's really the long term the goal for the rent is that you're you're just a you're either like barely cash positive 100 200 500 bucks a month Uh, but really it's that growth in the market in the real estate market so you can refinance and you don't pay taxes on cash out refinance and all that stuff i'm curious what you think about all of that and whether or not that's something that as a financial advisor do you get into that side of the business side of the investment thing yeah absolutely i mean real estate plays a great part in, in a diversified portfolio and for all the reasons that that you mentioned now taking that type of strategy can can take a lot of work and and be, be mentally draining too. 
Um, you know, my, my, <laughs> yeah, tell me my, <laughs> my early experiences in, in buying my first home, you know, gosh, 20 years ago and, and going through some of that myself, unfortunately was, it wasn't a very pleasant experience. Right. And, um, so I would, I wouldn't want to encourage somebody to go like all into something like that at the expense of their, their mental health. But some people are more, uh, more fortunate and have more fortitude to, to just do that kind of stuff. And I, I've, I've seen some great success in financial plans that, in, that include real estate. And that's something from a, from a planning perspective that, that can be included in, in a strategy in helping get you to and through retirement. I mean, having, having a real estate portfolio is a great asset uh, as long as it's not draining down on the other parts of your, your investment strategy. You know, if, if you're underwater and you know, your, your renters stop paying rent and you can't kick them out and it's not paying the mortgage and things are breaking everywhere, you're pulling money out of your own pocket. COVID hits. <laughs> yep, right. Um, again, the, the word that comes to mind is diversification. If, it, if it's a part and a supplement mm -hmm. to what you have going on, it, it can really be helpful. Um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of real estate in vet realtors and people that are that are really into that and i you know i see that they're heavy weighted in that stuff which can be great when the market's great or great if you've got long-term renters that always pay their rent on time but what happens if you're so far invested into that segment of finance and the shit hits the fan that can be really hard on a portfolio or like 2007 happens right where Mm -hmm. values of homes are, are plummeting. You can't, people are not paying their rent all over the place and you can't even sell this asset for anything close to what you paid for it. And you, you know, you may have to let them let, let some go. I talked to a lot of folks that were like, oh yeah, I used to have millions of dollars in real estate and I just have my small little house now. And you know, so moderation, right. Just like, just like anything. Um, yeah. but no, I, well, and diversification, like you're saying, I mean, like the people that the people that were diversified enough in 2007, 2008, they're the ones that bought all those houses. <laughs> now have it's a portfolio. They have a twenty million dollar portfolio, right? Because right? yeah. it's like you know that, like, and it's just like anything else: buy right. low, sell high, right? Like that's that's ultimately the goal. But you couldn't do that. If you're just barely making all the payments and, you know, the same, I, I sidelined the, the COVID statement, but, you know, the government decided that it was a great idea that renters didn't have to pay rent, but they also made everybody that held the mortgage, we, you know, they were still making the mortgage payments. So that math doesn't math. No, not at all. Very well. Um, <laughs> but you've got to have, but to your point, you have to have a diverse enough portfolio that, that each one of these aspects can support the other. And, you know, I distinctly remember building walls and hanging drywall at one of my houses that we did, um, which was dumb, by the way. But at two in the morning, I was rethinking my whole strategy, <laughs> whether or not this was, this was a good idea. But, yeah, the diversification part of it is just so important. And it used to be like, you know, I remember back in the day with financial advisors, like, well, you got to be 25, 50, 25, right? So you got the 25% aggressive, 25% you know, low risk and then, and then 50% somewhere in the middle. And, and like, that's not really diversified. That's just mitigating risks. At yeah. Different and levels. the term risk, um, what does that mean? I think, I think people have a, a different connotation of, of what risk really is in terms of a long-term term portfolio. And, uh, you know, I wanted to say something else before I, go into that, which are, which you're talking about, you know, buying low, it ties back to emotions again, right? Like the, it's one of the hardest things to do because the world's coming to an end. Like, why would I want to buy now? Why would I want to invest now? And the most successful investors that you talk to, they're like, oh yeah, that's the time to, to get in right then and there. Right. It's kind of, it's literally the flip flop of the emotions of the general population. And when that's tied to to risk, you know, and, and at least when when 
you're talking about a well diversified portfolio, it's it's not that you're gonna if you're talking about long term investing now, right? I'm not talking about short term, but long term investing. It's not that you're gonna gonna lose all of your money. It's how much can you take emotionally in the short term to be able to reach your long term goals? I mean, really, that's almost my whole job is handholding in those tough situations and making sure that the market didn't fall far enough for you to hit the eject button, right? Because it's mm-hmm. going to come back. I've got, I've got a big chart behind my desk that basically maps out the entire stock market since it started along with every president, the value of gold, inflation, every single major econ- uh, world economical event that has happened. And it, the line is like, if you, if you were to draw a line, it, it, it goes up, right? But it, it goes like this in the middle, right? Yeah. No, it's just, it's just, it's just a flat. It doesn't, it doesn't ever go up. But it, it goes no. down yeah, too. It's, it's over and, time. And it goes yeah. like this. Yeah, but it's, but the trend, it's the, the, from, from inception to where we are today, it's an upward trajectory. Right. Overall, and, right? but being able to hang in when that when when there's those down points to be able to participate in the in the upside and when you let fear take you out of a market and you miss those best days in the market uh it can be devastating to to a portfolio and while i'm talking about that i have a statistic here all right so so check this out um from 1994 to 2023, if you'd invested $10,000 in the S&P 500 and you just left it there, it'd be worth over $181,000. Now, if you reacted emotionally and you pulled out at certain points, you know, based on market conditions or with the headline news, whatever it might be, but you missed the best 10 days, what do you think that 181,000. Now I said days, not months, not years. You missed the best 10 days in the market in that, you know, 30 year period. What do you think that 181K would be worth? Less than 50. Oh, for sure. I, not quite, but it's still bad. Eight, instead of 80, and still 181,000, it's worth $83,000. So, about a hundred thousand dollar difference. So about half, about, yeah, less than less than by half, just right? missing That's, the days, um, as I mentioned. So, uh, you add a, you add ten more days of missing the best days. That's down to where you said under it's under fifty grand. You missed the the worst twenty days over a thirty year period. You're cutting your your investments uh, in in a, by a quarter almost. So, um, emotion yeah. and risk and. They're, they're tied to your end results and how people react during those tough times is what makes or breaks your success. So yeah, if you're, if you have a portfolio where you're set up too aggressively, when, when the shit hits the fan, which it's going to, I can't tell you when, but it will about every three, four or five years, um, your, your tendency is going to, going to want to pull out and try to time the market, right? And it's, historically mm-hmm. has proven to just be a bad strategy timing the market because you not only ha- decide when to pull out, you got to decide when to get back in. And while there might be a few yeah. advisors or traders out there that, that get lucky or can do it a few times, consistently over a long period of time for somebody's retirement, it's never proven to be successful strategy. Yeah, the emotional component's interesting. I'm reading this book, and you, if you're watching this on video, you saw me get up to get this book. But I'm reading this book called The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. I don't know if you've ever read this book. But I happen to be reading this, um, you know, fully in preparation of our interview. Not at all. I, was just, I just happened to get to this section this morning. But it, he lists, and he's talking about this, right? He's talking about people that went that essentially start, these are the businesses that started and what was going on in the world at the time when they started. I'll just, I'll highlight a couple of these and I can't see, so I got to put my glasses on. Uh, I just got, I I just got my new prescription Uh, and I I need progressives for the first time. So I'm like, great. Now I need it for far and close vision. So I feel you. So here, here's a, here's a tip on progressives. 
Okay, so one thing that I noticed that no one told me about. my I was getting severe neck pain. All right, so I, I work on the computer probably yeah. about half of my day, you know, doing different things. You work on your computer way worse than me. The reason my neck hurt is because I was doing this to try, and if you are listening to this, I'm moving my head back to get to the bottom part of my yeah. progressives. And I was like, what in the hell is going on with my neck? I was on a Zoom call with one of my clients, and they're like, why do you keep moving your head like that? That is so weird. Like, it was so subconscious for me that I never noticed it. So I went back to non-progressive, like lower power, you know, these are specific ones that I use, you know, when I'm in my office, my neck pain went over. So there's a little sideline tip for health and fitness, but I want to, I, I, I will put these on. So here's some of the times that people launch these huge businesses that are still around or some version of them are. Fortune Magazine, three months after the market crash of 29, FedEx, during the oil crisis of 1973, UPS, uh, panic of 1907, um, Walt Disney Company, they had 11 months prior to the crash of, of 29. Um, and I'll skip through some of these kind of things. Uh, Costco, the recession in 1970s, General Motors, panic of 1907, Procter & Gamble, uh, panic. Of, I don't know. These must be market panics. Um, United Airlines, 1929. Microsoft, recession of 73 mm-hmm. and 75. And, link, and LinkedIn, which was 22, 2002, which was... Um, so, like, to your point... Oh, Standard Oil, Rockefeller. I was reading the story of Rockefeller the other day, who was literally the richest man ever, basically, when you factor everything in. Standard Oil, he went out like everybody else was bailing out of the oil and gas market at the time. He went out and bought out all of those oil leases at the time because they yep. everybody wanted out because they were freaking out, saying oil is not the future. Which, can you imagine? Oil is not the future. I've got to unload. So he got all of these oil and gas leases pennies on the dollar. Until he ended up offloading some of those things, but he built a you know billions and billions of dollars because he was not panicking. He was like, "All right, you guys go panic. I'll buy your panic yes. effectively. I'll buy mm-hmm. your emotion. You know, because that's basically what you do. I'm buying your inability to manage your emotions around your finances or your business. And, and you know, story after story after story about." But, you know, it's funny how these major companies that have been successful have done the same thing you and I are talking about. Yeah, for sure. That's very interesting. And sure, there was some there was some risk involved at at the time. uh, And then they had to have the means to do that. But gosh, did that pay off? (laughs) Yeah, 100 percent. Rockefeller, to use that name, you know, just just a small name in in the world of business and finance. Right. Um, so I, I want to talk about, so that's with guys, my age, let's talk about guys that are young, right? Like my buddy, Kai, if you didn't go I listen did, to that actually. episode, he's, yeah. he's got a suit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you did. He, what? Well, he's an interesting man. He's an interesting guy. And like, dude, I wish that I was where, yeah, but like, but genuine heart, but like he's 22, 23 years old, something like that. And is already a successful business guy. So what kind of things would you recommend someone like him that, you know, either, either like I'm an entrepreneur, which is kind of a different right. different methodology than I just have my second job out of college. I'm making, I don't even know what you make 80 grand a year. Um, you know, that, that level, what, what are they doing right? And what should, and wrong and what should they be doing? I think, you know, it, again, it comes down to mental mindset and and mental preparation and a shift of i think it's so hard for people that age to think about retire it seems so far away that they're like i don't need to do that now like i you know i i want to live right now i might not i might not wake up tomorrow well you might live till you're 90 95 years old right so so what happens then and i think it's it's very easy for men especially to get into that mindset early on when they're young and successful but all of a sudden 21 turns into 25 turns into 35 and then you wake up and you're almost 50 years old 
and you don't have much to show for it because you were just living, right? So mm -hmm. then I think it's, you know, wrapping your head around delayed gratification, right? There's going to be some sacrifices now so that later you can live the life you always wanted to live, right? So what that means, is, you know, when you're young is carving out some portion of what your income and your revenue is and, and putting that away for later and not just under your bed or in a savings account, somewhere that is going to provide a long-term rate of return and pretty much the only asset class out there that provides the rate of return that, that you need over a long period of time is in, is in the stock market, right? So put that away and forget about it and ratchet, and ratchet up when you can. But the ultimate goal early on is to max out. I mean, I, I, would, I would recommend Roth accounts, Roth IRAs, right? Mm -hmm. First things first, if you're, if you're working for a company and they offer any kind of match, fill that bucket immediately. Don't leave that on the table. You're, it's literally free money. Like you can get 100% on yeah. your return like that. Because they said, whatever you put in up to a certain amount, we're going to put in for you too. Do that. And then outside of that, or if you don't have that available through your employer, a Roth IRA is something that allows your money to grow tax-free over time. Now, you use after-tax money to put into it, but the great benefit of that is, and if you start early in your 20s and you have 40 years of growth going on, when you go to retire, that's an asset class that you can pull out of without having to pay Uncle Sam. I think one of the, the biggest ouch points for retirees is that when they've got a large amount of money, let's say, you know, seven figure retirement, and they start drawing from that, and most of it's in a 401k or an IRA, and they're like, trying to get, let's say $10,000 out, but they got to take out 14 or $15,000 to get their 10,000 because they got to pay taxes on it. Like that's a huge, that's a huge thing. So, and successful people won't always be able to, uh, uh, to be able to put into a Roth account. You, you eventually you can make too much and you know, you're not allowed to contribute to those. So while you're young, while you're have an opportunity Give yourself a bucket for later that, that is not only tax deferred, like a 401k, but actually will become tax free should you leave it there until, until retirement. And, you know, whether that's coming from a raise or you change jobs and you're, you're earning a little bit more, try not to think of it as, oh, I got more money in my pocket. Hey, I'm, I'm going to go buy a, a new computer or I'm going to go on a trip or, um, I can eat, I can eat out as much as I want now. Whether it's that or, you know, reducing, you know, it's like you can have a Starbucks retirement. I talked to some younger people about too. It's like, okay, well, you think you don't have money for retirement. How much, you, how much do you spend on Starbucks today? Oh, well, I went there in the morning and then I went once in the afternoon. Yeah, I was like, you know, 12, 15 bucks. Okay, cut that, cut that in half. If, if, you, can, if you can cut that in half and, and start funding an IRA with that money instead, compounding interest over time is going to give you a fighting chance to retire when you want to and do the things that you want to brew and drink as much coffee as you want. Uh, but so a little bit of sacrifice in the now for that delayed gratification can really go a long way. I think it's the hardest demographic to get to understand that concept, right? When retirement seems like literally like an eternity away, you know, 40, 50 years away and you're telling me to put money away and not touch it and not spend it and not enjoy it right now. Like it kind of goes against this, this generation. I, I think, you know, it's even yeah. different than when you and I were, were growing up. It's now, now, now we've got our phones in front of our face. We can't even watch, we can't even watch a video more than one minute long before we want to go to the next one. Give me, give me more <laughs> dopamine, you know, give me that next hit. Um, mm -hmm. almost like a drug, right? And, and subscriptions and all, all the, all the small little things that we throw money at without even really thinking about if we were to just carve out a portion of that and put it towards yourself for your future family, 
you will find yourself in your 40s and 50s with some kind of nest egg to sit on and it, it, it won't be that that much work you know as opposed to getting to that point and starting you know I, every 10 years you wait you're 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 missing out on essentially doubling what you had in there in the first place isn't it funny that it's, I mean, this is, the, that's why they say youth is wasted on the young, right? Because <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it, 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 it's the cheapest time of your life, usually. You have the most time. Yeah. So, like, you know, that, that almost just hurt me deeply in my soul for you to say every 10 years you miss out on half. You know, we, we were fortunate that we actually had a, had a really good job after my personal training job and, and I ran health clubs and all that. Uh, and we bought our first house when we were 25. Um, and so that's how I can afford to be in the house that we are now because of, you know, real estate over time and being able to upgrade and all that stuff. We our house is too big now, but I built my wife her dream house out in the rural area of Montana. Oh, nice. So until all the quote unquote until all you Californians come to Montana and ruin our state, which is happening in the last two years. No offense <laughs> to you personally, because you haven't come here yet. Um, <laughs> we plan on staying at this. You know, we plan on staying in this house forever. And so, but you know, and so there's part of my investment. However, when I look back at our portfolio. And some of the poor business decisions I've made and having to hit some of that portfolio for cash and, you know, all that. And, and so, and then paying freaking taxes on it, because to your point, it's tax deferred. I don't know if anybody listening to this understands this, but the government takes your money and they will either take it today or they will take it later. You know, there's a reason we have a state tax, which is the most, don't get me started on the state taxes. But like, they, which is like, that's, you know, there's that whole taxation as theft, which to a point, and, and I think that's the greatest example of that, at least being true in that, in that thing. But to your point about tax deferred versus, um, you know, tax free, uh, you know, long term, the Roth versus traditional. And because we did a bunch of traditional and at, what's funny is at the time we didn't need to, like, I didn't need to save three grand right. on my taxes at the time that we were, we were throwing well, that was when that 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 was the max right you throw the three grand in and i know it grows over time but it's like i don't for three grand in my tax bracket do i should i really have saved this amount of money like what right 500 bucks <laughs> so you know it doesn't it, it didn't make sense so that's where good financial planners uh can can make that and i lo- i just love the entrepreneurial spirit that you have about this because it, when you think like an entrepreneur, you you think in a realm that is not fear-based. You think in a, in a realm that how are we, here's our situation, how do we maximize the situation and, and deal with risk and, and things we're facing and all that in order to get the outcome that we want, which, and, and to, your, to the business name, to get that ideal life. And, and I don't think there are a lot of people in your industry um, that are leaning into that, you know, I'm not saying that they're bad people and I'm sure that there are more people than I realize that are, that are like, have that heart for it, but I'm really impressed that that's Thank how you. you do business. 100%. But, so I want to talk about, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. We're a little over an hour now already. Um, let's talk about how we got connected, which is this book project. Tell me about the book. Um, I know you have a heart for dads. Um, and men in general. So I know that that's kind of the book project um, basis. So if you can walk me through that, I'm really interested. Yeah, um, I'm in the research process right now. So as my my publisher says, it's probably going to change over time exactly what pops out the other side. The more that I talk to people like you and and learn more about what's important to them and and the challenges that, that we face. But, you know, my passion, you know, again, starts back from from childhood and, and watching a successful man, my father, who I respect and love very much, uh, you know, have, have to work in his late stages of life, not, not really doing what he's passionate about, but just trying to have some more income to supplement that, that social security. But what I've noticed is that we as men, we have a lot of pressure on us. Uh, some of it's on the surface and mm-hmm. a lot of it's below the surface, right? I think there's a lot expected of us uh, to show up at home, to be making the right decisions, to be bringing home the bacon. Uh, and 
sure, there's been a big shift where women over the last several decades are equally in the workforce and facing a lot of those same challenges. But I think some of those pressures are still heavily expected of us men, whether whether they're real or not. Uh, I think we feel them, right? We feel like, you know, be the man, you know, Sh- show up at home, be the husband, be the father. And the, uh, the, the idea and premise behind why I'm interviewing more men to try to write this book comes from like, how do we, how do we get through that other side? What types of things can we be doing with our mental health and our wealth and our, the, our financial decisions that can contribute to getting to that ideal lifestyle, right? Everybody's lifestyle is different. We all have different passions, but there are some underpinnings there that are common thread between all of us. And I think, you know, we're in a society where, oh, hey, I got a pill for that, right? Oh, just take, t- take an anxiety <laughs> pill or, you know, this will help you lose weight. Um, those all come with side effects that I don't think we're all willing to to accept uh, over the long term and there are things on the financial side that are contributing to a high level of anxiety and stress uh, among men and and women um, but especially if you're a father if you're a partner um, there are expectations of us that we we we've, we've got to be that man and so the more that i learn uh, about what's important to other successful men out there. I'm also learning about their challenges, but I'm what I find myself also doing is is learning to be a better man myself. Uh, it's it's almost a discovery process in itself, which I think hopefully will come out in the end result of of the book. Right? Um, I'm I'm gleaning things off of almost every interview that I, that I have, and uh, it's something that I didn't necessarily expect to happen i i thought i was you know kind of researching and writing this this book to help others but essentially I, i'm helping I'm be a little selfish here it, i'm helping myself in the process and you know maybe that's the best demonstration yeah. that that i could have through the through the writing as as this develops yeah I, I, i've said that so many times about the podcast the podcast is for me you know it's you know we're the, yeah, this is this is a way for us to help people and reach people and there's a marketing aspect and all that but like the best part of this podcast is meeting people like yourself and you know I think we're up yes now that we've done and it's I would have never had these conversations and so that you know it oftentimes when we teach is when we learn the most and I, that's that's super interesting and I, and I can't wait to, to hear more of you know when as the book progresses and and um, I started writing my own not too long ago. Oh, awesome. Um, I, I'm not doing, I'm not doing nearly the amount of research that you are. Um, so maybe I should, but I've got a lot of stories or we've got all these stories in our lives and just crazy stuff. So it's kind of story strategy, story strategy, but the book writing process is a, is an interesting one for sure. Especially when you're trying to do everything else you're doing. So man, that's, that's awesome. I'm glad that you're learning more about yourself and also gleaning all this information to get something out that will help tons of people, tons of men and people in general and their families. And to your point, I think that there's something innate in most men that we have and, you know, take the, the women's live and all, you know, whatever that, those gender roles and how you want to define them. But I think most men have an innate sense of providership in us. And so when there are things that, that make it not feel like that we're doing that adequately, I think that's where that, that anxiety and stress and, and all of that come. And I, you know, as a small business guy, entrepreneur, I do that to myself yeah. too all the time. And um, so I think that that's something that we all face. Awesome. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Hey, <laughs> no, I was going to say, um, you know, I think as men, maybe more so than women, we, we tend to feel like we're like out here on our own and we got to do it ourselves. And the fact of the matter is you need a, you need a team around you. Um, you know, I mean, sports analogies are a little cliche, but you know, you, you can't go out on a field and play a football game all by yourself. You get, you got to have 
<laughs> other men playing positions and roles to help get you to that end zone. And, you know, that's, uh, that's where I kind of see myself uh, being able to assist in moving men down the field to reach their goals. And, you know, I think we tend to have that common thread of hiding behind uh, 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 being macho in a lot of ways. Like, oh, I, I, can, I can handle <laughs> it myself. I got this. I'm a man, you know, and li life's a lot harder than that. And you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the 1960s anymore. It's okay to, to uh, reach out and connect with other men and get a support and have a team around you. Yeah, and be able to say, look, I'm, I screwed this part of my life up, these decisions, uh, you know, and I know somebody like yourself can help me kind of rectify that and, and move forward. And that can be tons of areas of life, whether it's health, fitness, marriage, family, finances. Uh, I know I want to book a discovery call, even though we've talked multiple times. Uh, how, how would someone go about finding you, getting more information? And at the end of the day, like I said in the beginning with coaching with me, um, it, you want to make sure it's a good fit, right? Like, it, it, you know, you're not a fit for everybody. Not everybody is a fit for you. But how, do the, how does that process look? How do we find more information about you? Um, and just yeah, that's a great it. question. Uh, IdealLifeWealth.com is the uh, probably the easiest way. I've got a, a booking link on there where you can schedule a discovery call or just a, a brief, you know, uh, touch base type of fit call to see if it makes sense moving forward. And, uh, yeah, I've also have a, a Facebook and a LinkedIn presence, but Ideal Life Wealth Management and my name Daniel Poppers should pop up in a Google search, and there's lots of lots of ways to connect with me there. Uh, always happy to uh, have a free consultation, have a discussion, and go from there. Awesome. Well, this is super interesting, Daniel. I appreciate you taking the time, and I can't wait to watch things progress with the book. And uh, you know where to find me if you need. Uh, anything else from me in that regard in terms of you know, where where I sit and my stuff. So um, I appreciate you, though. Thank Hope you so much. It was, a, uh, it was a pleasure. If you're looking to really maximize your life and become the man you were made to be, head over to MaxedOutMan.com and get your journey started today.